pictured this in a studio somewhere far, far away. Experience. Right, so the latest news from the Gulf, as you may be aware, is that journalists are going to be sent home if they can't run a mile in less than 14 minutes. So it looks like the Daily Star will be losing their new war correspondent, Steve Cram. <laughs> Which brings us to... Sport. Sport is two experiences, like experience of it on TV and experience of it when you try to do it yourself, and the boundaries between the two are rarely breached. And the crowd here at this Winter Olympics are hushed in waiting for the freestyle routine of the Russian figure skating champion Andrei Serenko to begin. Serenko needs an average 9.9 .9 to take the gold. Serenko has begun by holding onto the barrier around the edge and wobbling. He's got about three feet round, and oh, look at that, he's fallen over. Now up, up he gets, up he gets, no, no, down he goes, and he'll lose marks there for dropping his slush puppy. And now, yes, there it is, the bitter glance as a seven-year-old goes past doing it really well. <laughs> Other sports, conversely, appear much more complex than they actually are. Sumo wrestling, for example, is meant to be this really technical and ritualistic sport, but surely it's just two blokes too fat to fight properly. You know, <laughs> like the fat kids used to at school. And welcome to Tokyo for the Sacred Dragon Sumo Challenge Final. The finalists are on the right, Pogo Patterson from <laughs> Green Hill, and on the left, Tank from the Walker's Christmas Adverse. <laughs> And straight away, Tanks closed in with an oi shoko. This involves shutting the eyes and flapping the arms about wildly with no idea of your opponent's whereabouts. And there's the bell for the end of dinner break. Other sports, however, have no connection at all with the real world. Walking, for example. I mean, don't professional walkers look back at the height of their careers and think, oh, I've trained really hard to look like a toss pot. <laughs> I mean, a marathon walk is basically a 20-kilometre mince. <laughs> After all, what is the point? Because there is no situation where you'd have to move that fast where it wouldn't be better to run. <laughs> but unless you're walking that way that you do when there are some hard lads behind you. And uh, you start to walk fast but think, I'd better not run because then they'll know I'm not hard. But once I get behind that corner, I'll leg it. But in fact, you're digging your own grave because by now, from the back, you're doing an impression of John Inman. <laughs> The only other sporting event that involves stupid walking is the equestrian dressage. In this, the rider gets the horse to walk sideways. This he achieves by hitting it on the side of the head with a hammer. <laughs> Horses have a terrible deal in sport. I mean, for a start, they are just shot at the drop of a hat. For a broken leg, that seems a bit rough. Why can't they just have, like, a splint and some plaster and, like, maybe a nice sit-down for the rest of the race? <laughs> it's like with horses, all veterinary decency seems to break down. Sorry to call you out, Mr. Harry. It's only Bessie here. He's got a stone caught in her hoof. Oh, not to worry. We'll soon have that sorted out. <laughs> oh. Anything else? Well, Dobbin's been off his food lately. <laughs> no, no, the old all fine. Hello. Good Lord. <laughs> the Queen. How can I help you, Mum? Here's my daughter. <laughs> this kind of cruelty to horses only persists because the government refuses to legalise dogfighting. <laughs> and we, at the Mary White House Experience, not only believe that dogfighting should be legalised, we think it should be televised, instead of crufts. <laughs> uh, uh, you see that programme, Watch Dog, that they have? That's not actually a dogfighting programme. I've watched that show for three years now, and I haven't seen a single pregnant pit bull with his eye hanging out. <laughs> Hello, it's a game, Watch Dog. 
We investigate the bicycle safety helmets that just aren't that safe, and electric blankets that could turn your home into a blaze. But first, it's over live to the back of a disused warehouse in Leicester for Red Fang versus Ripping Boy Rex. <laughs> Your commentator is Harry Carpenter. Good evening, there's a big purse for tonight's fight. The winner gets some extra win -a lot and the loser gets thrown into the canal. With me for the ringside commentary is Scooby-Doo. Oh, Red Fang looked very confident at the way. Despite the fact that it was right, he got the enough. The only other sport we'd like to see more of on TV is wrestling. If nothing else, this would bring giant haystacks back to our screens. A man named after that most terrifying of things, a haystack. <laughs> The government anti-drug slogan at the moment is drugs, the effects could last forever. Surely it should be drugs, the effects could last forever, if you're lucky. <laughs> it's like a Duracell advert, no ordinary sulfate looks like it or lasts like it. <laughs> Another government slogan is, don't share your partner's works. What a works? Surely the government have just made up this word because it sounds sort of streetwise. And now there are like loads of heroin addicts who still share dirty needles but like adamantly refuse to lend out their copies of the complete Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> heroin is seen as the number one evil drug, but though psychologically traumatic, like some doctors contend that cutting off heroin is the physical equivalent of a bad case of flu, then this wouldn't be so dramatic in those bleak adverts with a tormented 15-year-old kid. Heroin. I can't handle it. It's just masturbating 14 times a day that's the problem. <laughs> and if it is like flu, in the next series of adverts, your mum would simply have to write a letter to school. Dear Mr Avery, Stephen has spent the last two weeks off withdrawing from drug abuse. But don't forget how we won the 100 metres in 4.5 seconds. <laughs> also, why is withdrawal from drugs called cold turkey? Is it something to do with Bernard Matthews? <laughs> but we must, of course, come out against these drugs because I, for one, would never want anyone watching to find themselves in a casualty ward late one night, having to look a doctor in the eye and say, but we're her friends. <laughs> Presumably as well, this woman has been going round at the party she's just been at, asking if anybody's got any drugs. <laughs> or any quack. What? Quack? Nah, sorry, love, I think you've had enough. Perhaps we can get you an interpreter. Oh, well, uh, hello, Anna. Uh, uh, all right. Well, uh, blah, 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 Meanwhile, one has to consider how much of a friend this woman really is. Because not only does she allow her friend to overdose, she is quite willing to entrust her medically to the hitchhiker from Burt Lancaster's Foster's advert. <laughs> so what she should be saying is, hold on, you don't even know what an ulcer is and you're operating on my twin. Lucy in the Sky with Diamond shows the creative magic of acid-induced lyrics in lines like, newspaper taxis appear on the shore. Like, Wow, what was going on there, man? <laughs> oh, no, mate, I'm not going south of the river in this weather. No, the moat will get all smudged and turn into papier mache. <laughs> <laughs> It's commonly held that the fastest driver in Britain is Nigel Mansell. Wrong. It's Princess Anne. <laughs> Seen here, leaving Heston Services on the M4. <laughs> Mark Phillips, Viscount Lindley and Princess Diana have all been stopped for driving too fast. Now, presumably, if they lose their licences, the royals have to travel by taxi. One should hang a left here and burn up this Capri at the next lights. <laughs> British motorways have a reputation for being the best in Britain. Fortunately, the... <laughs> Fortunately, the government have made lots of uh, government information films about safe driving, which get shown at one in the morning and cover such fascinating subjects as checking your mirror, watching out for that child, and the dangers of overtaking on motorways. Now, all these films have one thing in common. They were all made in the 1960s and have never been updated. So all the men have Engelbert Humperdinck sideburns <laughs> and wear tank tops. 
all policemen ride bicycles and everybody drives the Austin 1100. <laughs> the greatest road safety campaign ever was the one for the Green Cross Code, which was immensely confusing for children. One minute they'd be watching one government information film which was telling them, Don't talk to strangers. And the next minute, they'd be watching another government information film in which two kids were happily chatting away to a tall, muscular man in green tights. <laughs> offering to help them home from school. According to insurance companies, the most high-risk drivers are young men under 25. Rubbish. Anyone who has ever driven will know that the most dangerous drivers are pensioners. <laughs> it doesn't matter where he is, a granddad always drives the same way. And here at Silverstone, Frost is still trying to overtake Santa, but as they come up to the bend, who's this blocking them in front? It's Granddad! <laughs> He's refusing to get out of the way! Santa makes his move, but Granddad's fading late without signalling! <laughs> Constructors' Championship, McLaren lead with Ferrari second and third, Austin 1100. People do tend to do rubbish things when they're driving. Like if you're on the motorway and you're running low on petrol and you see a sign saying, Services one mile and 32 miles. People always say, oh, I think we can make it to the second one. <laughs> Why? Because they enjoy making a mental note of where the emergency telephones are? This, of course, brings us to garages. Now, garages nowadays sell just about everything you could possibly want. For example, I bought this digital watch at a garage, and it's fine, except that uh, every time I put petrol in my car, the numbers start going round really fast. <laughs> now, for some reason, garages always sell charcoal briquettes, plant pots, and bags of fertiliser. <laughs> as if the owner was going to open a garden centre, but at the last minute changed it to a petrol station. Now, what all this merchandise means is that if you go into a garage with friends, you'll be in there for at least half an hour. Well, let's just get some petrol. Oh, Hugh, can you get me a bouncy? Yeah, okay. Oh, can I have a bouncy? Yeah, two bouncies. Actually, then, yeah. no, I'd rather have Maltesers. Okay, Maltesers and a bouncy. If they haven't got any Maltesers, I'll have Minstrels, but not M&M's. Okay, oh, right. and an orange juice. Right, okay. Oh, can you see if they've got any milk? Yep. You? Yes? Can I have a bag of fertiliser and some charcoal briquettes? <laughs> Most people will also put off getting their car fixed until the original insignificant rattle has become a major mechanical breakdown. And there is no other mode of transport in which people are allowed to behave in this way. This is uh, Captain Harmsworth speaking. I'd just like to remind all passengers to not panic about the clouds of black smoke which are pouring out of the port engine. It's been doing that for weeks, hasn't it? Yes, yeah. it has, yes. Yeah, it's it's really, really, yes. it's really I mean, We've had this sure. plane, what, three years oh, now? three years We've now. We've had terrible think. trouble with it. Terrible. It won't start in the mornings. We've got... <laughs> we had two new gearboxes new there. New starter motor. This one from an Austin 1100. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, look. We're gonna blow up. <laughs> no, no, no. That temperature gauge is terrible. Just give it a thump. There you are. Oh, we are running low on fuel. We can refuel at Athens or Jakarta. Oh, I think we can make it to Jakarta. <laughs> yeah. The White Lion Pub in Romford, Essex. Recently, this pub acquired new owners who spent a lot of time and effort doing it up, with the result that it became a very pleasant place to go to for a Sunday lunchtime drink. <laughs> All of which makes what happened last Sunday night even more sad. I was barred. <laughs> Tonight we ask, is the British economy in recession? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Tonight we ask, is the British economy in recession? Will recession lead to depression? Does stagnation produce inflation? Will depressive recession produce stagflation? Will inflationary recessive depression induce a reflationary situation? And how did Norman Lamont manage to nick Dennis Healy's eyebrows? <laughs> Why are interest rates so high? Some people blame the EMS. You're unbelievable. <laughs> no, EMS. Opinions differ on the likely long-term effects of the recession. Asked whether it was caused lasting damage to the food industry, spokesman for Bird's Eye and General Food said no, while the man from Del Monte, he say, yesterday's figures suggest that volume sales of fruit juice concentrate are holding up well against seasonal forecasts. <laughs> 
However, at the moment, indications are that we are seeing a rerun of the situation in 1981. This will mean that we are likely to see a steep rise in jobless figures, and worst of all, we will see Duran Duran wearing those rather horrid frilly shirts. <laughs> In the housing market, however, the effects of ever-worsening recession are already obvious. <laughs> While lack of available cash has also affected this year's sales. Normally, shoppers queue outside department stores in order to secure bargains. This year, however, the managers of department stores are queuing outside number 18 Haverstock Terrace in Pinner on the rumour that Mr and Mrs Jenkins have a couple of quid they're thinking of spending. <laughs> But how can the householder combat inflation? Well, in his last budget, John Major acknowledged the problem by announcing a new savings plan, Tessa, or the economy is severely shite, actually. <laughs> Retailers, too, are fighting back. Most affected by the downturn in consumer spending are those stores that have a sale on all year round anyway. In an attempt to gain custom, one such chain has already adopted a radically new and different approach. Yes, it's full price week at Allied Carpets. <laughs> The really hard person says, do you want to fight in a thousand different ways? The important thing to remember is that the cue to fight need not fit in at all with the situation. Number one, in an orthodox Muslim country. Phew, it is hot. Yes. Did you spill my pint? <laughs> Number two at a meeting with Prince Charles. Prince Charles, I can't agree with your views on architecture. Are you saying my mother does it for money? <laughs> Number three, at the Stevie Wonder concert. Oi, are you looking at me? Hard people have certain accoutrements to go with their hardness. And if you have one of these but are not hard, you can get into trouble. For example, if you have the wrong sort of haircut. Oi, mate! Skin it! Skin it! Oh dear, must be more windy than I think. <laughs> now, what are you going to sing for us? Of course, hardness in males is not confined to human beings. And the extraordinary thing about conflicts like this between two male moose is that they will involve the communication of very definite messages. Snort there, for example, means very specifically, are you calling me a puff? <laughs> and that tilt of the head in response translates as, yeah, I am. Sorry, I didn't quite catch the name. <laughs> it is, of course, the male with the biggest antlers who is assumed to be the most sexually successful male within the community. Uh, the primary feature of the hard person is that he does not run from not nobody. Of course, this means the British, although crap at sport, are always foremost in hardness. And here at the Olympic Games 100 metres finals, the contestants are on their starting box, and they're off. Every single one of them, except for the British contestant, you can't see him, but he's standing still and shouting, Come back, you shitters. What a marvellous performance, demonstrating to the watching world that the British do not lose their bottle just because someone's got a pistol. And now over to the fencing, where the British fencer is not wearing a mask or using a sword, and certainly not putting his hand on his hip. Of course, male relationships... And I've just heard that the British pole vaulter has asked for the crash mat to be removed. <laughs> of course, male relationships... Oh, and I've just heard that the British entering the diving has bat his head on the diving board as part of his freestyle routine. <laughs> of course, male relationships in the culture of violence have been warped by all this business. The spectre of who is the hardest can poison even the closest friendship. And now we've just got time for some late news. I can, I can have Ronnie Barker. Did you hear that Barker? I'm calling you a butler. What are you going to do about it? And it's good night from him. <laughs> At the moment, this is all having a global impact because the reason that most people here are happy to see our troops setting up for war is that despite the fact that Iraq has the fourth largest army in the world and has killed millions of people in the last ten years, they still have a sneaky feeling that your Arab is basically not that hard. You know, because like they wear slip-ons, don't they? <laughs> Britain, meanwhile, has sent out the SAS. This is presumably due to all the mystique which surrounds the SAS, which is strange, really, because aren't they just sort of punctual Millwall fans? <laughs> but these kind of misplaced Western assumptions about Iraqi hardness will not affect actual military planning in the Gulf. OK, men, here's the plan for Operation Desert Rat on January the 15th. 
The Royal Fusiliers will assemble here at 0800 hours, face the Iraqi line and shout, come on and have a go if you think you're hard enough. <laughs> Yes, our men will then put on gas masks, as at this point, the Iraqis will, according to intelligence, cack their pants. <laughs> the future of the nuclear family is said to be in grave danger, and they really ought to try and move away from Sellafield. <laughs> That's enough satire. Let's talk about dads, or to be precise, other people's dads. At least one person at school always had a really embarrassing dad who was never aware that he was being embarrassing. <laughs> when you went round to their house to watch Top of the Pops, he'd come in and say, Hey, what's this? It's got a good beat. <laughs> and then start dancing in that way that only your parents can dance. Like the dummy from the Volvo advert in a cardigan. Embarrassing dads also say things like, Still got your eye on that Susan What's-her-name, Steve? <laughs> Don't do anything I wouldn't do. There is, however, very little he wouldn't do, judging by the expression on his face during the fifth-year gym display at the last parents' evening. <laughs> Then there's mums. Mothers feel an overwhelming desire to guide you down the right path. Whatever you do, your mother has always done it as well and will always say, I don't want you to make the same mistake I made. Which left me wondering how on earth my mother had got her head kicked in for nicking Martin Nichols' bicycle pump. <laughs> I myself have a classic Jewish mother. My mother is the sort of woman who, if I fell into a river, would shout, Help! Come quick! Come quick! My son, the university graduate, is drowning! <laughs> Conventional morality still frowns on one-parent families, but they are commonplace in nature, notably in the case of the black widow spider. In this species, as you may know, the male gets eaten by the female the moment they finish mating. Male black widow spiders have the lowest incidence of premature ejaculation in the world. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll go and make a cup of tea. Do you fancy going to see arachnophobia? <laughs> Most of the TV role models for family life are curiously coy. The Waltons, for example. Why did Ma and Pa Walton spend so long saying goodnight to all their kids, one by one, every night? The answer is they wanted to make sure that none of them were doing what teenagers do when they're on their own in their bedroom at night. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Ma. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Pa. Good night, Mary Ellen. Good night, Ma. Good night, Mary Ellen. Good night, Pa. Good night, Jim Boy. John Boy. Uh, good night, Ma. Don't come in. <laughs> the biggest nightmare in family life is that as you get older, you find yourself turning into your parents. The one thing you wanted more than anything else to avoid. You know the nightmare is coming true when you catch yourself saying things like, You won't be so keen on voting Labour when you start paying tax. <laughs> or, That's my chair. <laughs> and then, of course, there comes the day when you turn on top of the pops and say, Who's that? <laughs> or even worse, Hey! What's this? It's got a good beat. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. A Securicor van style Securicor van leaves the NatWest Bank on the Edgware Road carrying £250,000 in gold bullion. It then turns left into a narrow side street away from the traffic as it does every week. So I need a driver, two men to take up the guards, and it should be an easy job. <laughs> At the present time, as some of you may be aware, it is extremely hip to wear flared trousers. 
This practice emerged in Manchester, which is why they lost their bid to host the 1996 Olympics. <laughs> the Olympic Committee said it would cost too much to widen the running lanes, <laughs> and they wouldn't be able to tell if the marathon walkers were actually running. <laughs> Flair is ranked as one of global history's worst fashion mistakes, which we've now had to live through twice. But then again, there have been many other dark ages of dress sense. <laughs> Master shopkeeper, give me without more ado some crisscross garters, a goodly pair of thigh-high leather boots, and a velveteen cape, if you please. Sorry, mate, you want Miss Selfridge. <laughs> Round the corner and down Pudding Lane. Right you are. One of the most embarrassing garments to buy this time would have had to have been the codpiece. The trauma of buying one must have been similar to buying your first bra or condom. Good day, uh, shopkeeper. Uh, I'd like uh, some leeches, uh, a potato, uh, one of those Are You a Witch home predictor kits, <laughs> and uh, a cod piece, please. Certainly, sir. Which size would thou prefer? Small, medium, large, or obviously not true? <laughs> uh, large, please. <laughs> it looketh somewhat roomy. No, it's fine. It's fine. Hast thou bought it to dance a madrigal with the Countess Olivier by Chiswick Water? No, I'm going to release a single called Word Up. <laughs> uh, Elizabethan fashion was a reaction against the austere styles of the Middle Ages, where design was uh, a bit medieval. Well, Mad Meg of Blackwater is wearing a torn sack covered in manure and flaky bits from her scabies. <laughs> Her footwear is very cleverly designed, so you can't tell which is her rotting foot and which is her rotting shoe. <laughs> Meg's previous modelling work includes the gargoyles at Chartres Cathedral and, of course, readers' wives. Possibly the greatest period for male fashion was the Roman era, where men got to wear pleated miniskirts and still pull Italian women. <laughs> men also sported cloaks, and over the top of the head, they had a big brush which would suggest that Mark Antony spoke something like this. Ah, 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 boom, boom! <laughs> friends, friends, Romans, countrymen, Mr. Roy. <laughs> I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Not now, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 